April 17th, TDC meeting to order. And I know we've got one more waiting on coffee, but I thought we'd get started. Um, I do want to welcome Commissioner Brian Scott here. We, I talked about this in January that we wanted to kind of bring him on, unfortunately, as a non-voting member. Um, but this way he could, he'll be right up to speed next year when he's the chairman. Um, and so there'll be no, no lull because he'll slip right in and know exactly what we're doing. So thank you for coming. I'm thrilled to have you here. And so I'm going to start, Clyde, I'm going to start with you and have you go around and do the introductions. And just your name and where you, who you represent. Good morning. Clyde Smith, Bill Mar Beach Resort, Treasure Island. Bruce Rector. Bruce, Bruce Rector, Mayor of the City of Clearwater. And welcome, Bruce. This is your first meeting as well. Yes. Good to be here. Good morning. Doreen Moore with TRS, Travel Resort Services, vacation rentals throughout our great beaches. Brian Scott, Pinellas County Commission, District 2. Russ Kimball, Sheridan Sand Key, Clearwater Beach. Ryan Lowak, Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Okay. Amanda Coffey, County Attorney's Office. Copley Gertis, City Council Member, City of St. Petersburg. Good morning. Trisha Rodriguez, the Trout Expo Tours in the Clearwater Ferry. Great. It's great to have you all here. Um, I do want to say one thing on the agenda. Uh, Mayor Bajowski is not feeling well, so she's not going to be here this month um, to accept her uh, appreciation award, but she'll be here next month. So. So we're gonna so so we'll save that for next month. Um, I need an approval Madam of minutes. Chair Mike Williams here as well. Oh, and Mike you. Williams, it's good to see you. Um, good to see you too. And I'm glad you could join us. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with. I'm looking for an approval of the March 20th minutes. So Aye. moved. Do second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. None. Okay. So that passes. And, and do I don't see anyone any cards for public comment? Is there anyone here that wanted to have any public comment? No, great. Then we're going to go right on to um, presentations, and I want to invite up Chris. Uh, Chris is it Minner? Minner. Chris Minner from Tampa International Airport, and we are thrilled that you are here. Thank you, and we're looking forward to all the news we have on the airport. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning. Um, Distinguished members of the Tourist Development Council, I'm Chris Minner, Executive Vice President at Tampa International Airport. My teams are responsible for all of our marketing, communications, air service development, real estate, concessions, and commercial parking. So if it makes money or brings uh, passengers to, to fill your, uh, your, your bed room nights, that's what my team is all about. Um, it's been about a year since the last time we had the privilege of providing an update to you, and it's been a very, very busy one at that with a tremendous partnership with Brian and the entire Visit St. Pete Clearwater team, and, uh, and a lot to, to be very, very proud of. So we'll just jump right in. I want to start by saying a special thank you for the support that your team at Visit St. Pete Clearwater provides for our volunteer ambassadors. <clears throat> Uh, this was a program that I had the privilege of standing up when I arrived here in Tampa Bay 13 years ago. And as you can see, we now have almost 230 active volunteers that come in and spend their time at the five information centers that we have across our campus. They are a warm, smiling face, welcome visitors from literally all around the world. And you can see 23,000 service hours over the course of the last year and 140,000 plus uh, interactions. Um, in addition to the support, and we're distributing your visitor guide uh, for anybody that's looking for information about the, um, the beaches, uh, you also provide support for two familiarization tours. And in fact, tomorrow, uh, our team is going to Gulfport. And so they're going to have a walking tour through the town and then uh, a ride on the boat um, to kind of get a sense of, of what's going on in the community. And it's just so very important because when people arrive at the airport and they see that very first person, they're saying, What's there to do around here? Well, it's your team that helps to make sure they know exactly what there is to do around here. 25 million annual passengers, that's the, the business that we're planning to complete this fiscal year, which will be an all-time record for us. We just completed the very busiest spring break in our history, and you can see 2.5 million passengers for the month. Our slow, slowest period is September, and probably not a surprise. Kids go back to school, and things kind of go into a lull. Um, but we have four air sides today with 58 gates, and we'll talk about the next air side that uh, we're already beginning development on. 
66 restaurants, bars, and shops. And our uh, parking spaces, I don't know if uh, you guys who probably travel through Tampa International Airport all the time are aware, but if you book your parking in advance at tampaairport.com, you'll save $2 a day. Um, so a great feature for our local visitors, or local residents. Economic impact of more than $11 billion a year, and we have about 11,000 people that work full-time at Tampa International Airport, many of them, like myself, proud Pinellas County residents, um, but we're glad to be a dynamic economic engine for the region. Our largest airlines are Southwest, Delta, and America, and you can see how they stack up over there. We are not dominated by any one airline in the way that maybe a Dallas-Fort Worth or an Atlanta are. Um, and what that means is when, um, when you look at the strength and vitality of our market, the airlines that are serving this region are serving this market because passengers are beginning or ending their journey here. We are not really subject to the whims of an airline who might change their corporate strategy and have a hub that they would pull and go somewhere else. So the traffic that we have is truly, truly our traffic. 97 nonstop destinations, I'll show you those in just a moment. And those are our top 10 markets. Probably not a big surprise. Most of them are the major markets along the eastern seaboard and over into the Midwest, but domestic is our biggest market for Tampa Bay. This is our total passenger activity, and I'm sure you'll recognize that uh, COVID impact. Uh, at the bottom of the, the depths of our business, we were down 97.3% on our business. And that was a very, very difficult place to be. But you can see that we have roared back to life now again to record numbers of traffic. And we have outpaced the recovery of the nation at large by about 10 percentage points. In terms of our revenues, we've also seen tremendous gains as well. Um, and, and very, very proud of the way that our commercial team has been able to provide value-added goods and services for travelers and uh, through our concessions program that celebrates the flavor of Tampa Bay. When you look at our revenue pie, I just thought this might be of interest, um, and I'll focus on the four biggest uh, areas that generate revenue for us. Our airlines pay us fees, rates, and charges, um, as an example, a landing fee. Every time their aircraft touches down, they also pay us rent for their back office space, and they pay us for the privilege of using um, their ticket counters and, and their gates. Uh, in addition to that, parking and ground transportation. Every time you park at Tampa International Airport, you're helping to pay our salaries, and so I genuinely thank you for that. Um, we are the eighth largest rental car market in the United States, and so you may recall about five years ago, we opened our new rental car center connected with the SkyConnect People Mover train, um, and that has delivered a tremendous level of customer service, and so that's uh, that program. And then the terminal concessions program rounds it out. So our spring break period, uh, if, if your hotels were busy, uh, we were feeling it as well. 90,000 passengers per day on average. All-time record, just short of 100,000 passengers, but 550 average flights per day was uh, just a tremendous, tremendous operating pace for us. And I'm really delighted to tell you that the team did an extraordinary job. Our customer satisfaction scores remained very, very high throughout the period and a very strong operating result. When we go on the road with Brian and his team to meet with airlines and talk about opportunities for new air service, we don't represent ourselves as Tampa's airport. We are the gateway to the west coast of Florida. And so this is, as an example, our domestic catchment area. And you can see anchored by Pinellas and Hillsborough counties. What you see in green is generally within uh, a short hour drive time, and that's about 3.3 million people. Uh, growing to 3.6 by 2030, and then 5.3 million in our secondary catchment area. But when you look at who's actually using Tampa International Airport, we're able to use the same or similar data systems to what Visit St. Pete Clearwater uses to track where passengers are coming and going. And so we can see nearly 30% of our passengers are coming or going to Pinellas County. This is our route map, so proud of it. When I arrived here 13 years ago, the only dot that we had on the west coast of the United States was uh, LAX. And so now you can see uh, with Alaska Airlines returning to San Diego, Breeze with their nonstop flights to John Wayne Orange County Airport, you still have LAX with four airlines uh, competing there. We've got San Francisco with two airlines competing, also two airlines competing in Seattle, and Alaska Airlines providing our nonstop flights to Portland. This last year, we also added Calgary, uh, which has gotten off to a really great start, and we love uh, welcoming our visitors from the north. We'll talk about some of these other new markets as well. 
One of the questions that I get when I'm out talking with the public are, well, what are the largest markets where we don't have nonstop flights? And so I'll just be very transparent with you. On the international front, FCO, some of you will know, is uh, Rome. And we have 48.5 passengers per day each way right now that are going to and from Rome. But I'm also here to tell you that I don't have an airline with a appropriately sized aircraft who's in a position to be able to take advantage of that market on a nonstop basis. So the way that we're serving our Rome passengers today is with connecting itineraries over hubs in London, Frankfurt, Zurich, and then all of the other domestic hubs that other airlines are operating from TPA. Um, so when we say, okay, well, what actually then are the markets where we ought to be focusing our efforts? This is our air service development strategic plan. And what we do is we use data and analytics to try to understand not only where are the largest passenger flows, but also where are the airline strategies lining up with additional fleet, with alignment with airline hub strategies, and opportunities to actually be <coughs> the most profitable new route opportunity for these airlines. What's interesting to me, and this is the first time it's been this way in my 13 years here at Tampa International Airport, is several of these markets are now served. Uh, as a moment ago I mentioned, San Diego and Portland, um, both are markets that uh, are now operating with nonstop flights. It is core to our strategic plan not to abandon our efforts with those markets. It's up to us to make those markets thrive because I guarantee you all other airlines are very closely monitoring the performance of these newest markets. And when they see markets come in and be wildly profitable and see expansions into other new markets, airlines say, hey, I want a piece of that. And conversely, if an airline makes an investment in your market and comes in and does not succeed and they wind up pulling out very quickly, then that sends up red flags that would tend to keep other airlines from having interest in your market. London Heathrow, um, with your bold assistance, has been a tremendous success. That's Virgin Atlantic, who launched November before last. Um, those flights now are, are truly thriving. They are now on a year-round daily basis with their partners, Delta Airlines, nonstop flights on their uh, brand new Airbus aircraft and doing very, very well. You may recall, right before COVID, Delta Airlines operated nonstop daily flights to Amsterdam. And we've been working very hard with your team to try to bring those flights back. And so fingers crossed, hopefully you'll be hearing from us soon uh, with good news on that. Turning to Latin America, Mexico City, we just saw our announcement on that. The three remaining markets, Bogota, we've got four airlines that we're in conversations with right now, is a tremendously large unserved market. Sao Paulo for Brazil, uh, your team will tell you there's tremendous demand for Brazilians coming to Florida. And that is a clear opportunity for us as well. And then you look at Lima and you say, well, gosh, I'm not sure Peru is the biggest market for Pinellas County. The reality, though, is the airline LATAM has been developing Lima as the fastest growing airline hub in South America. And from Lima, they serve all of Chile and uh, Brazil and Argentina and beyond. And so this is a, a tremendous opportunity for us that we see on the medium term. So let's talk about Mexico City for a moment. Um, this absolutely is a triumph of collaboration between Tampa International Airport, Visit St. Pete Clearwater, and our other partners in the region. Um, what we do is we pre-negotiate packages of support in advance, and the airport is able to do two things to support airlines with our own resources. We have fee waivers that we basically give away all of the fees, rates, and charges that we otherwise wouldn't have collected because the flight didn't operate. And then in addition to that, for a daily nonstop flight, we'll give up to $750,000 over the course of the airline's first two years in the market. And then we work with our other community partners to find ways to augment and to match those funds. And so um, we are absolutely thrilled that July 1st will be the inaugural flight. We have not had Mexico, non -stop Mexico City nonstop flights in decades. And so this is a tremendous opportunity. There is tremendous wealth in Mexico City. Um, if, if you don't know, it is the largest city in all of North America. And also, Aeromexico provides tremendous connectivity behind their Mexico City hub to all the secondary and tertiary markets across the, the nation of Mexico. And so we could not be more thrilled. Also, 
Delta Airlines is the metal neutral joint venture code share partner for Aeromexico. And that means that our very successful Delta Airlines sales team on the ground here in Tampa Bay is responsible for the local point of sale on Aeromexico. So we've got tremendous inbound opportunity to bring new visitors to our market. We have tremendous outbound opportunity with people who live and work here in Tampa Bay that want to take advantage. And we are very bullish on the success of this flight. They will begin it daily, again on July 1st. It'll start with the uh, Embraer, uh, which is a, a full-size jet uh, with about 99 seats. And then already this coming Christmas, they have scheduled us to upgrade to the 737 product. And so that'll add another 60 seats to the route. In addition to Mexico City, on the domestic side, you can see uh, we've had Frontier, Breeze, um, adding a, a lot of new service. Uh, our first ever nonstop flights to Bangor. So uh, for your friends in Maine, tell them they got to come on down and see us. On the international side, so proud to tell you that uh, after celebrating their 10th anniversary in our market, Copa Airlines went up to six times a week operations this last winter, and that's up from four times a week the year before. Um, we are working hard with them to build them now to a daily service pattern year round. Our friends at Edelweiss, we thought as soon as we got nonstop flights to Frankfurt, which they're co-owned by the Lufthansa Group, that we would see our nonstop flights to Zurich disappear. Far from it. In fact, um, this coming summer, Edelweiss will be up to four flights a week in their peak season. And so there is tremendous demand for the Swiss market um, in Tampa Bay. And finally, Discover, uh, if you're not familiar with that airline, that is basically Lufthansa. They operate a, a Lufthansa product inside the aircraft, so the same lie flat seats, the same catering, um, and they provide a really lovely level of service. Every flight carries the LH code, and you can connect at Frankfurt to the entire Lufthansa network. So our team is constantly scouring the globe, meeting with every airline that has the capacity to add nonstop flights to our region. We just got back, as you can see, in March, we had 23 airlines that asked for the opportunity to meet with Tampa International Airport to look at opportunities for growth to our region. And so uh, we are, again, very bullish on opportunities on the horizon. I'll pivot now to talk about our facilities and what we're doing to grow to meet the expanding needs of travelers to our region. You may have heard we have a three-phase master plan, and we are now settling into the third phase of that, which will deliver our all-new 16-gate Airside D. Our Blue Express curbs have now been open for, I believe, three years, and believe it or not, we are up to nearly 50% of travelers coming to Tampa International Airport being dropped off to get on their flights are now using these express curbs. And if you haven't used them, they are absolutely the handiest way to get in and out of the airport. If you are not checking a bag, you can be dropped off here. Nobody on the curbside is trying to wrestle the large luggage or looking for luggage carts and those kinds of things. And you just go up one set of escalators, hop on the train, and you're at your airside. It really cannot be more convenient than that. Um, we're working on the red curbsides, and so those are some construction pictures that we took yesterday morning for you. And, um, and so those will be open in 2025, and that will effectively double the capacity of our ability to get people in and out of America's favorite airport very, very conveniently. And other project that's going on right now is our bag claim upgrade. So we have completely transformed the third floor, which we kind of call the transfer level. That is beautiful. Our ticket counters we was the last one to, to be refreshed. And so as you can see, all new carpet, new ceilings, and all of that will be complete uh, end of next year. In addition to that, you may have seen over the course of spring break, um, we, we definitely on peak, peak, peak periods had some lines from our security checkpoints out at the airsides that were extending even back into the main terminal as we had to meter passenger traffic going out to the airsides. I'm delighted to tell you that no passengers were waiting for massive quantities of time. The reason that we had to do it that way is because of the construction that we're doing out at the airsides. Airside A and Airside E are the oldest unmodified TSA checkpoints at our entire campus. And although the throughput for the TSA checkpoint is pretty good, they simply don't have the queuing space to accommodate all the passengers that are arriving at the peak of the peak of the peak of the day. And so we're investing about $80 million on these projects, and we're, um, we're working through them as fast as we can. Those will be complete next year. And finally, to Airside D, um, we are now at about a 15% design, and uh, we're looking forward to getting our, uh, our first 
more detailed cost estimates on that, but the project is moving forward exceptionally well. We have enthusiastic support from our airlines, um, from our board, and across the entire community. So as you can see, um, we are uh, hopeful to be able to open that in the first part of 2028. And Honestly spoken, as they say in Germany, it can't come fast enough. During our peak seasons right now, um, we are very congested. And if this facility was available today, we could absolutely put it to use. So in addition to being uh, last year named back-to-back -back J.D. Power number one airport for customer satisfaction in North America, we also were just notified by Airports Council North America that we took number one for size and region for overall passenger satisfaction. Um, we are just really um, delighted to be America's favorite airport, and that just cements us. And then, as you may have heard, our CEO, Joe Lapano, has announced his retirement. Um, this uh, is not absolutely imminent. He um, is really proud of the team that he's built at Tampa International Airport and the partnerships that we've been able to grow throughout the region. So his uh, contract goes through April of next year, and our board is in the process of going through to select the next leader of, uh, of the Hillsborough County Aviation Authority. Um, but on behalf of our CEO, Joe Lapano, and our entire executive team, uh, again, just thank you so very much for all of your support. I'll leave you with all the different fun ways that you can stay connected uh, with America's Favorite Airport. Um, our Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, uh, we have a very special and unique voice. Uh, if, if you haven't seen it, we like to have a lot of fun. Um, and there's some very entertaining content, lighthearted. It gets people engaged, and then that way when something pops up that's a critical message that we have to get out, we now have almost 400,000 people that are following us across all of our social media channels, and we're able to get those messages out very, very cost-effectively and immediately. Um, also, we have an award-winning airport newsletter that has all the kinds of updates that we just talked about, and so would invite you to subscribe there as well. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. I'd be delighted to take any questions if you have any. Thank you. That was outstanding and great news. I love, just love our airport. So I'm going to ask questions here, and I'm going to guess Mike is going to have a question. So, Mike, if you'll be patient, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, anyone have Thank any you. questions? <clears throat> well, I'm going to get to you right, right away because um, I don't have any other questions. Oh, before you do, I, I made one error this, this be when we started. I need a motion and a second to allow Mike to participate via Zoom. So I look for a motion. Move approval. Second. Any, okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, perfect. So go ahead, Mike. Madam Chair, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, Chris, uh, great presentation. I, uh, I have to tell you, um, uh, I'm a million miler traveler and, and over the last 30 years coming in and out of Tampa Airport, and visiting probably the majority of the airports in major cities around the world, there is no facility that compares to Tampa International. It is just a joy to fly in and out of, and, and I've been to every major airport in the world. Um, so hats off to you for your, your continued success. Um, Chris, the other thing that I wanted to point out is I'm so pleased to see that um, we, are, we are focusing our efforts on driving international arrivals and new airlines to service our region. Um, you know, specifically Western Europe and uh, Latin America, I think have been underserved um, for quite some time. And there is a, uh, a demand from those geographic areas to come to the beaches and to come to our area. And your progress and success that you've made there is, is noticed and, and welcomed. Um, you know, you talk about Brazil and Sao Paulo, uh, you know, we forget they come here in the summertime because it's their winter down there. And, and Brazil has long been a, a great feeder market to Orlando. It certainly can be one for us as well. So uh, a long-winded comment, but a question, how can we assist you and your efforts um, with Brian and Santiago in furthering these marketing objectives to, um, to, to further grow and accelerate the growth of your marketing efforts. Well, thank you so very much for your very kind remarks. And um, 
And I, as a world traveler also, I can say there's, there's nothing that feels better than coming home to Tampa International Airport. It, it really does okay. make you feel welcome to the region. So um, thank you very much for your kind comments. Uh, with regard to the partnership, I, your team is already doing it. And um, so we talked about the direct support for nonstop flights, uh, preparing in advance those, those packages of support so that the airlines understand truly what's available to them in terms of resources when they want to inaugurate those new nonstop flights. But beyond that, there is work happening at every level of my team at Tampa International Airport and every level of Brian's team here at Visit St. Pete Clearwater. And I'm looking at the staff who's over here in the corner. You've got an extraordinary team that represents you on the global stage. We're able to share uh, data about the travelers that are coming in and out of Pinellas County that provides tremendous insight to the airlines who can see passenger flows. So they know how many people are on those airplanes and they know where they're connecting, they know how much they paid, they know what class of service, but they don't know why. And so what your team is able to do in the background working hand in hand with us is to be able to provide that color. And so um, that is something that I'm just delighted to tell you uh, has been a strong partnership that has uh, lasted with us the entire 13 years that I've been here. So your, your team is doing great work to support us, and thank you. Uh, Copley, did you have a question? I didn't. Thank oh, you me. did not. Okay, Russ. Can yeah, I'd like to take a minute and, and thank you for everything, Chris, in regards to Joe and the team over there. And, and uh, I started out with the business development for international business way back when they the Wright brothers started coming over from Europe. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, the question I would like to ask is to Brian. Brian, he talked about the 750000 that he has as a budget for fees and, and marketing. Give us an idea what our budget is each year and how much we've been able to use the last couple of years. We've had a good relationship with Delta, I, I know that. And, and uh, this year, during your first year, and, and budgeting that you've done there. Help that tell everybody about this relationship of financially, how much we commit each year to, for this development. Thank you. Yeah, so um, again, I want to recognize Chris and his team because they really are the tip of the spear um, that makes this happen. And I think it was day one or two that I was on the job when Chris reached out to me and said, come on over to the airport, um, we've got to talk. Um, and since that time, we've worked on a constant basis, and he's brought me up to speed on what it takes to land these new direct international routes. And so annually, we do uh, have a line item for air service development support, and um, we are focusing on that. And um, every year we've had it in there. Some years we've used more than others, um, but we've, we've ramped that up uh, in, the, in, in the current and, and upcoming fiscal year. So um, we, Chris mentioned the support uh, and fee waivers that they have. Uh, we work with Visit Tampa Bay um, to match that, and um, it, it goes a long way in getting these airlines here. So, With the $750,000 as an example, Mr. Kimball, that the airport puts on the table, and then between Visit Tampa Bay and Visit St. Pete Clearwater, who match that $750,000 plus uh, about, well, the, add in the fee waivers, and it comes to a package that's almost $3 million of total support. And that is only the start. What then we have is you've got Andrea, who's going to be down, for example, in Mexico City, telling all the tour operators, the travel agents, the travel press about this new service, and amplifying the dollars with the sweat equity of Visit St. Pete Clearwater, Visit Tampa Bay, and also uh, Global Tampa Bay, which is a conglomeration of Pinellas County Economic Development, uh, Tampa Bay Economic Development Council, and Pen um, Pasco County Economic Development, as well as St. Pete Chamber, Tampa Bay Chamber, and other community partners that are helping us to, to leverage those dollars to get the maximum impact. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, great presentation, Chris. Thank you. And, and this puts in perspective when you look at, at Pi. And Pi is a great airport, but it handles 2.5 million passengers annually. That's 10% of what Tampa International does. So, it kind of puts it in, in, in perspective. When Airside D is complete, what do you think that's going to bring the passenger capacity to from the current, you know, 25 million? 
That, that's a great question. Um, so the FAA requires us to do a master plan every five to seven years that looks out over a 20-year horizon. If you had unconstrained capacity, what would your passenger activity look like? With the addition of Airside D, that will enable our existing airport campus to reach a level of service at around 35 million annual passengers. So another 10 million beyond where we are today. In addition to that, there may be other opportunities for us to optimize our existing facilities. And as we shared with our board several months ago, we have preserved land to the north that would enable us to have an entirely new complex that, that could potentially even double the uh, amount of passenger activity that we could handle into the future. Um, all of that to say that as stewards of Tampa International Airport, we're really, uh, we feel the weight of the responsibility not to shirk on the customer satisfaction scores. We want to deliver that product. But it continues to be a concern that we can grow the airport, we can't necessarily grow the transportation networks in this region. Right. And so it does no good for a person to fly 580 miles an hour from Switzerland to land at TPA and then sit on the roads trying to get to America's best beaches. So I think that you know the entire region really has a lot of work to do to make sure that we can harness that um, opportunity. Right. Yep. Good point. Thanks. Thank Any you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Madam Chair. Oh, Mike. Go Thank ahead. you, um, Chris. Uh, you know, Commissioner Scott brought up high, um, and certainly, you know, each airport has its own um, objectives and goals that you have to serve. Are there opportunities to collaborate on marketing efforts with Pi as you're looking at at new carriers coming in? Perhaps ones that that don't fit at at um, Tampa International or ones that don't fit at Pi. That there's cross pollination going back and forth that you can supply each other with um, opportunities. Uh, thank you for the question. And I would say first, um, there are a number of ways that we have collaborated uh, with PI. Uh, Tom Jewsbury and his team uh, are great partners. Um, we've uh, all been a part of the Tony Jana Society for the last 10 years. So when you talk about marketing, one of the ways that we do what we do is by inviting leaders from the aviation industry here to Tampa Bay every single year. And Visit St. Pete Clearwater is a, a major supporter also of the, the Tony Janus Distinguished Aviation Society. Um, in terms of um, collaboration on air service and, and you know, are there ways to co-market, um, I, I think that you know, the future is, is gonna be in a very interesting time for our region. And uh, you know, Tampa International Airport, even if we doubled the capacity of our airport, that we wouldn't be able to grow much beyond that. We have a very limited campus. And so uh, I think that over the long run, you're gonna have airports certainly uh, at, at Pi, down the street in Sarasota that are going to have to play a major role in lifting passengers to and from uh, our region. Great answer, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? I wanna thank you so much for coming. Your presentation was wonderful and we always love having you here. Awesome. Great to see you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, and we're gonna move on to the destination metrics with Eddie Kirsch. Thank you all and look, looking forward to giving this report. Um, so let's jump right into it. Uh, in the month of February, we were about 77% full, which is uh, down from 83% in 2023. That's looking at our hotel occupancy, which is coming from STR. Our vacation rental occupancy was at about 81%, which is also down from where we were in 2023. That information is coming from key data. It's coming from about 99 property management rental companies and about 3,200 listings. So that's a, a look at, at that data. Um, we did see that our vacation rental supply has grown, which uh, our TDT collections as a result came in uh, nearly flat. Um, so looking at that TDT collection data a little bit further, um, it was about two tenths of a percent less than what it was in uh, February of 2023. And you can kind of see over this 
uh, seven-year growth that it, the, the numbers have been rising. This kind of stalled out this month, but uh, we're continuing to see a lot of uh, vacation activity in our area, of course. Looking at it from a year-to-date perspective, we're down about 2.5%, uh, a little more than 2.5% um, than where we were in February or up till February of 2023. There's a few events I just wanted to point out that, that could be playing a role in some of this data. Um, obviously, we've talked about and touched on Hurricane Ian and how that affected last October. Uh, Tropical Storm Nicole is probably notable to, to also mention in November of 2022. And then we had this unnamed coastal storm, if you guys will remember, in, in December of this year that did seem to affect some of those numbers and, and was kind of over a weekend too. Um, and then we kind of see this January and February sort of coming in a little bit more. Uh, so after we saw this, we wanted to dive into these numbers a, a little bit more. Um, and this is looking at February from 2020 to 2024, and you can see kind of the, the key uh, destinations in our area for tourism development tax and uh, this, this miscellaneous other category that we have uh, includes the vacation rental. So we added that name to it. And you can really see this, this rise in, in the vacation rental uh, uh, TDT collections, as well as a little bit of a rise in the St. Pete uh, TDT collections, whereas everyone else was a little bit below or, or almost flat to where it was last year. Um, so we wanted to dig into that a little bit further, and this is also information that we are receiving from key data. It is um, basically data that is uh, the listings on uh, VRBO and uh, Airbnb that's kind of scraped and provided to us. So um, we have sort of seen this rise, especially on Airbnb in terms of the, the listings. And if you look at the total listings from February of 2023 to February of 2024, there was about a 21% increase. Um, we don't know the overlap between these two, so I do wanna clarify that this is an account of the vacation rentals in our area. It's, it's really just looking at the listings that are available on these um, OTAs. Digging into that a little bit further to see where that uh, rise or change is happening, it, it, it is happening across the board, but it is growing in, in different areas at different rates. Um, certainly the St. Petersburg kind of area grew by nearly a quarter from where it was last year. Um, and our St. Pete Clearwater Beaches area, which is pretty much the whole span of the beaches, also grew um, at a slightly lower amount. Um, but it did make up the largest portion of our vacation rentals. Um, so jumping to some of our other hotel data and, and just kind of taking a look at that, um, our, our daily rate went down a, a little bit by a little less than $3 uh, from the hotel side, and, and that's also reflected on the vacation rental side. It went down about $2 from, from where it was. On the bottom of the screen, this is looking at just our hotel data, um, but sort of that five-year uh, or six-year change um, in fe from February of 2019 to February of 2024, and you see that that strong ADR is, is really lifting and continuing a, a strong revenue per available room, despite a little bit of a dip in our occupancy. Looking at sort of our competitors and, and, and how we're doing, um, or maybe our friends and neighbors, let's say instead of competitors, uh, for the most part, it seems like the beach destinations kind of performed uh, in, a, in a fairly similar way. So Fort Myers, Sarasota, you know, Bay County, those, those are kind of all more of a, of a beach uh, area, and, and they're all sort of behaving in a little bit of the same way. I did supply, um, include the supply index on the bottom to just sort of see you know, what size of these markets are relative to ours. Um, so when we look at Naples, we can see that it's, it's a much smaller uh, inventory there. So we kind of have to take that into consideration. If we look at the um, sort of southeast and, and eastern markets of the state, um, we're seeing you know Miami perform fairly well, a little bit of a rise in Orlando too. But again, these beach destinations are, are kind of all behaving a little bit in the same way. Um, so why do we think you know, some of this hotel uh, performance was down? Um, there, there could be a variety of reasons, uh, but we did want to note the difference in weather and temperature from uh, February of 2024 to 2023. Um, certainly the days were a little bit cooler. Uh, there was more rain, um, and that, that rain event really came, kind of came over a bad time for us when we had the Shriners uh, Children's Clearwater Invitational. Uh, and, and also to kind of know, you know, events um, 
in, in February of 2023 could have also played a part. The Firestone uh, Grand Prix of, of St. Pete was a week earlier, so you could have seen some a little bit more of that um, visitation come in at the end of February of last year. Um, so that's, that kind of includes our, our look at the hotel occupancy and, and, and what is going on from that uh, perspective, but looking at kind of who our guests are, um, we saw a rise in the deplanements, as, as you might have noticed from Chris's presentation, and we wanted to look into that a little bit further and, and look at kind of the population growth of our uh, county, of our surrounding counties, and we really took note that from 2019 to 2023, there's about 500,000 more people. So this kind of makes sense that even if occupancy might be down a little bit in our markets, um, the monthly deployments can still rise as, as we have population rise within our uh, regional area. This data is coming again from Symphony, and it's looking at uh, mobile data along with uh, US Census estimates, looking at kind of our overnight guests to, to day trip guests. We wanted to do it a little bit different uh, than just our, our visitor profile, so we looked at this data. There's a lot of similarities. Um, so the, the median household income is, is a little bit higher for our overnight guests as we have a little bit uh, more of the higher uh, household income guests coming into our destination. Uh, but for the most part, the age groups look very similar and they're very even. Um, there's not necessarily a spike in, in any one particular age group um, beyond the, the 65 and older is, is a little bit higher than the rest of those age demographics. Um, we also saw really a fairly strong alignment with the data that we did see in near to our historical visitor profile data. So uh, that was good news for us to sort of see and confirm. And looking at um, really a map of where our guests are coming from, I, I think it's interesting to look at it by origin city, but also the map paints you know, a, a picture as well. We had a lot of overnight guests from uh, in-state from the south, from the northeast, from the Midwest. Hopefully this isn't surprising data, but it is good confirmation from other sources that we have been seeing. Our day trip visitor, and I do wanna know, we've pulled out our sort of regional area, and we wanna do more evaluation on, on that separately, but um, we can see that our regional day trip visitor, or our day trip visitor from outside our, our local areas is often coming from kind of that I-4 area. Uh, there's also some visitation from up and down that I-75 where all those uh, communities are as well. So where did they go when they came here? Um, in the month of February, we saw that 81, um, 80, almost 82% visited a city. Um, so again, you know, kind of tying back to the uh, rise in, in St. Petersburg, uh, we're seeing nearly a half of those people went to St. Pete. Uh, a little less than 30% of them went to Clearwater, and any other uh, destination was less than 10%, with the uh, next highest being Tarpon Springs and Dunedin. Um, about 30% of our guests did visit a beach, um, and that was very well spread out through all of our all of our destinations, although um, Clearwater Beach, you know, sort of took, re reigned supreme a little bit here. I wanted to do a little bit further of a dive into what those guests kind of look like, so I, I took uh, the Pier 60 guests in the month of February to the St. Pete Pier guests in the month of February, and I was happy to see that the devices from each of those were, were relatively uh, a similar amount. And you know, some of the takeaways that I, I found interesting here was um, the St. Pete Pier visitor was much more likely to be from inside of the state of Florida, whereas the Pier 60 visitor was likely to be from um, out of the state. So there are sort of some different visitor profiles depending on uh, what places that they, they ended up visiting. And you can also see kind of uh, some differences in the cross-visited points of interest as well. Um, and most of these kind of make sense, you know, based on where they are geographically from this main point of, of interest, but uh, definitely something that we, we will continue to be looking at. So why did they come? This is, again, looking at our visitor profile information. We had about 405 responses. Um, this isn't really surprising data, but I think that this is good confirmational data for us again. Uh, <clears throat> well over half came and visited for a vacation, and, uh, and a little more than 20% also came to visit their friends or family in the area. Um, that, that makes up a large percentage, whereas um, other reasons were, were 
fairly small relative to, to those big ones. Um, some important factors in the month of February for their decision to visit ended up being the weather, of course, um, for you know Northeast and Midwest and even Southern markets that, that will always be a big pull, especially you know in these seasonal months. Um, it was interesting to see attractions in the area have a little bit more of a rise versus uh, beaches that, that suit my taste. So we did see kind of attractions uh, overtake that as an important factor in their decision to visit. Um, this was also supported by a question about their most liked aspect when they visited the destination. Again, tractions uh, were, were really high up here, and the beaches were a little less down. So um, this is looking at the month of February, and again, because of this poor weather, this could be a little bit of a factor in, in this equation. And when we look at the March data, we'll sort of see if uh, those switch at all, as we've had much better weather this past month. Um, and again, this is good information for us to be aware of, but the travel planning resources recalled, you know, nothing got above 50%, but the highest ones were opinions of friends and relatives, social media content, user-generated content. These all have something in common, where it's someone that's saying something about this place. So it is important for us to remember that, you know, when, when we're looking at these. And then the other factors um, also sort of have a little bit less in common. Um, it's 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 oftentimes not that direct person-to-person -person communication. Before you go ahead, yeah. um, Mike has a question. Okay. Oh. Go ahead, Mike. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Um, uh, as always, a great presentation. You know, this is a, this is a, a sticky topic, but, you know, as a hotelier and looking at the Looking at the growth of our vacation rentals, the Airbnbs and the VRBOs, it's concerning to me as a hotelier that we're now almost at a 50-50 split between the number of vacation rental units in the market and the number of hotel rooms that we have. And we, I think we, we have to be cognizant that certainly it's a, it's a commentary on how travelers want to vacation, but um, uh, these tourism development dollars, taxes, were created by the hotels in conjunction with the local governments to support tourism. The hotels started it, and, and I can't help but feel at times that the vacation rentals are cannibalizing um, visitors and room nights from the hotels, and it, it is, it's very concerning to me. I'd be anxious to hear from our other TDC members, um, uh, Doreen, especially yourself and, and also other hoteliers. Uh, do you share my concern and, and are we positioned well to manage this continued growth? Not sure, Eddie, if you got a response to that, but does any other member have comments regarding I, that? I would just clarify something that Eddie touched on at the beginning of his presentation that differed from um, what I may have represented in um, uh, previous conversations is um, we, we're not at 50-50. Um, we are, those are not total number of units. Those are total number of listings. And it's difficult to determine exactly how many units there are. Um, so I was uh, misrepresented at the 50-50, the um, but it's certainly, it's certainly getting up there. Just for clarification, Mr. Williams. Yeah, no, Brian, thank you very much. And, and you know, that makes it a little bit scarier because those are the ones that we know about. How about all the ones that we don't know about? These are just the ones that are advertising. Um, it's um, it's it's a concern. Uh, I'd be anxious to hear from other TDC members if they share that concern, or am I being somewhat of an alarmist here? Doreen's got some comments for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was going to combine all this at the end, but I, I just wanted to kind of go back a step and say that working closely with the team. Through Brian, um, we have been refreshing the survey location so that we can get additional information, uh, and that's good. Um, and that, but back to your your comments, Mike. The 
tourist development tax is collected and paid by those uh, third party sites, the OTAs, or uh, sorry, not the OTAs, but the VRBOs, the um, Airbnbs, all of those are collecting and paying tax uh, on the units that are registered. Um, so I personally feel that we've brought the management companies and a lot of the owners of the properties apparently are registering both with Pinellas County and with the state and paying those taxes. So those increases that we're seeing in the tax, to me, if they're paying and they're registered, I don't look at that as cannibalizing hotel rooms. I think it's just a segment of our market that um, is, you know, just building on our industry. It's bringing people here. Those are the things that, that they, the types of accommodations that they want to use, and it's giving them choices. I don't think it's adversely affecting the hotel occupancies. So, uh, you know, to, to and I, I guess I, I take a little bit of um, umbrage with cannibalizing uh, in terms of, of rooms and, uh, and sharing with the industry. I think going back, Russ, all those years ago uh, from a hotel standpoint and watching how vacation rentals and how we registered those of us who started in this in the 80s, um, we've all worked together. And, and it's our industry as accommodations, whether it's kind of hotel resorts, hotels, um, and then the Airbnbs and the Verbos of the world. So I, I don't look at that as being a negative impact. I appreciate what the team has done uh, to strengthen the information that we're getting, trying to break out that. Uh, yes, there still are a lot of unregistered, I'm sure, um, but it's a lot better than it was, and we are all in limbo working with state legislated actions for rentals and uh, in various areas. So I think we're all working together is, is to the bottom line, and I don't think it's adversely affecting. Hopefully. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'll just make two quick points, and, and Mike, thanks for bringing it up. Um, and really, it's both, they're on both sides of the ball. So uh, Airbnbs are obviously up based on this in St. Petersburg. What I'll tell you, Mike, is most of them shouldn't, are not allowed. And so uh, we just don't have the manpower, to be very honest with you, to go out and be able to stop all of them. And so I, I don't know that I'd use the word cannibalizing. Is it affecting hotels? There's no question about it because people are staying in Airbnbs that in places where Airbnbs aren't allowed. Um, and so that's part of it, and we're continuing. If you, you've prob you may have seen a story on Bay News 9 where uh, I think just a couple of weeks ago they pulled over 500 listings on Airbnb and VRBO that were in areas that shouldn't be there. And I've continued to try to work with state legislators about, listen, if we're gonna, if we're gonna have this relationship with Airbnb and VRBO, we've got to not let them list in areas that they're not allowed. And so, um, and, and that is in limbo. We might get preempted and that may all go away and that'll be the end of that conversation. The, the other thing, and, and Mike, you may not like this comment, hotels have gotten really expensive. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, it's hard, you know, my, my, my entire family is going on a family reunion. We're not staying in a hotel because we can't find a hotel where all of our family members can afford it. And so I know that this is a destination a lot of people want to go to, but it's an affordable option. And so there, there's got to be some balance. And, you know, I know I, you probably don't like hearing that, but you know, it's, it's gotten really, really, really expensive and there's gotta be a balance and VRBO and Airbnb provide that balance for people. I mean, if you look at the median income, $79,000 median income of our travelers, and you look at some of the hotel prices, that's why they're staying at Airbnbs. And, and so, you know, I, I just, I, it's a little bit of an elephant in the room, but you know, do I want our hotels to hurt? Absolutely not. But I also want people to travel here because we need the TDT dollars, we're putting them to use, we've got a lot of things going on, 
And so we've got to find a balance. Um, but, you know, again, I, I, I said at the beginning of my comments, it's both sides of the ball. I'm not sure what the solution is. City of St. Pete's certainly trying to, um, for lack of a better term, crack down on, on illegal listings. But frankly, there's so many of them, we don't have the manpower, but we've got to find a balance for people to be able to travel here. So Clyde. thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Copley. Clyde. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd have to say I agree with both of you um, that the Airbnbs and BRBOs are definitely affecting hotel occupancy. Uh, where we see it, especially, I mean, on Treasure Island alone, we've seen a tenfold increase, you know, in the last decade of uh, available Airbnb type. Um, it's also affecting the restaurants um, because people are cooking, you know, yep. in, in their units versus going out. Um, but it is expensive and prices are going up mainly because our costs are continuing to go up. Um, minimum wage has gone up $3 in three years. And that's for every server out there, um, every employee, because it follows even if they're already over minimum wage, you, you have to make those adjustments. So our costs are going up. We're really, except for insurance, VRBO and Airbnb costs are not going up. One thing that would be helpful, and I love some of the new data, obviously it's prompted some great conversation, is possibly look, a star report also tracks group um, versus transient, and that's where they, the hotels do have an advantage is we have our, most of us have our meeting rooms, and that is where we have an opportunity to capture what Airbnb and VRBO can't. Um, so it'd be interesting to see some of the star uh, data on the group and as it goes up and down, and that's not even weather related, so it's a little more stable if you can get that group base there and to see what star has to say on that year over year. That's something that we'll look into. Great, thank you. Okay, any other comments? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I had Bruce and then I had Brian and then we've got Russ, so go ahead, Mayor. Well, I just, I thank you, Mike, for raising this because um, it, it's, it's uh, I, th I think the, do the growth is dramatic. It's the numbers we're seeing are pretty well underreported. I think it's, it's uh, growing even at a more increasing rate than what's reflected in these numbers because of the underreporting folks under the radar. That, um, I, and I, I can't tell you, you know, the hoteliers can tell you better whether it's, a, you know, directly affecting um, their occupancy or not, but there's a larger issue for the hospitality industry, and that is um, the growth of these short-term rentals. In Clearwater, I know that there's, in, in, in countryside, there are short-term rentals, in uh, you know all all different parts, way away from the beaches, there are short-term rentals now, and folks coming in for vacation but staying that far away from the water, but still, they're using that instead of a hotel room, and uh, so what it's doing is it's it's eating up our residential housing inventory, mm -hmm. to make it even harder and harder for hoteliers and all businesses, but particularly our tourism industry, to staff and uh, and to find housing appropriate housing for staff. So. Uh, so I think there are a number of issues here, and Mike, and I appreciate you raising it because it is something we need to give attention to and be intentional about because it's it's going to affect our economy in many ways, not just uh, not just the hoteliers. Okay, Commissioner Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, just a, a comment. I mean, short-term rentals are, are are here to stay for sure, but I think we need to do a better job of, of managing them. And the county commission tomorrow is in our work session is going to have a presentation by staff on, you know, what we can do with our ordinances to, to, to try to get our arms around that better. And the point that uh, Mayor Rector brought up is one of my bigger concerns is that is affecting our ability for the affordability in this area because there's so much of that housing inventory that is now corporate owned and basically just on a, on a short term rental basis. So. And it is also the number one complaint that my office gets from constituents about, you know, I got blown up all this past weekend with it, is what are you doing about this short-term rental that is trashing the, the fabric and culture of my, of my neighborhood? So it, it's definitely a, a problem that we need to figure out ways to, to manage that uh, much better. Uh, but aside from that, I, I do have a comment or a question rather on the, on the hotel occupancy rates. Easter was early this year how does that, does that affect hotel rock occupancy rates? And maybe I don't know if that's something for, for Russ or, or, um, or yourself, but how does that typically, because next year it's gonna be later, but this year it was early and the Grand Prix was early as well. So how does that play? Into it? Yeah, it affects the data that we see in the month of March uh, for this year, certainly. Um, so because it was at the end of March, we'll see more of that um, visitation around Easter come in. 
Um, there's, we've been looking at kind of how Easter affects our, our visitation numbers, and, and so we will have more information uh, the next month for, for that. Uh, but we do see a drop post-Easter, um, so you know, that, that can affect April's numbers. Um, Brian, did Madam you want to make a comment real quick? Yeah, just um, a uh, a couple comments. Oh, First of just, all, uh, Mike, just a, uh, just a second. We've got lots of people before you. Before you. Oh, certainly. Thank okay. you. Okay. I want to talk Easter, Mike. So um, <laughs> one of the things, we had that same question, and I know um, for those of you that were out on the beach this Easter, it was a busy Easter, and then um, leading up to, and then on Easter, I happened to be out there, and I said, where did everybody go? Uh, and so in getting with Eddie, they, they looked, and you'll see next month kind of the five-year uh, trend on the, the days leading up to Easter occupancy rate, and then on Easter, and then the days leading out. So I think you're going to see a lot of that and how that um, affects based on when it was over the last five years next month. Because uh, Easter also is how schools do their spring break. Um, and so when Easter's late, spring break, a lot of times for school follows suit, so that's not a surprise. Um, Russ, you are next. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of comments. I'll give you little pieces that uh, have come up, and I agree with you, Mike, uh, in what you're saying, um, but I also agree with Doreen and, and uh, uh, Copley and, and, and all on it, and uh, things have changed, and I think that we need to also look and, and challenge uh, Brian and the team what are we doing in the future now, changes, in order to look more at segmentation of our marketing also, and that we have different types of hotels, a lot more limited service and full service and group hotels. We have St. Pete is coming along with, I would call them more boutique hotels in that area. It's just a combination. I think things are changing, and then you got VR uh, vacation rentals, and you got Airbnb as another segment, and how that gets broken down too. I think we need to be looking at that and challenging the team. And is our marketing that we've had shine the right direction today for all these markets, or what are we doing differently? I think we had a great team, and I think they need to come back to us uh, on that. Say, where are we with some of these segmentation? where we were. As far as Easter, my comment there is, we always look at March and April as a combination. We look at how far we can book group into and where we stop and then where we bring it in from the other angle and where the school vacations are. So it's just as the chair said, it's a combination of that March and April. Business is down. It showed here at 2.5%, 2.8%. And, and I'm concerned, and I'm going to ask the question back to say, Where's the look? You told us that March we were looking at, I mean, May, we we're looking at business was coming up. Where are we looking now for the rest of the year and what are we doing? I think is, is part of that. The other comment is that um, the tax collections for, the, for our taxes, we pay Pinellas County tax collections and it's a pretty good amount. They have reported to us before on what they're doing and how they're doing it and everything for tax collections of our, for our business. I think we need to probably bring them in and make them accountable and say, where are we doing today uh, on that? Uh, just because we've heard from, from uh, uh, Brian also that they're doing it, we need to know where we are just specifically for our tax. The other, the other side is that I have is, is group business is dear to the bigger hotels, and that's a big result. That and sports are two areas that I think we really need to be looking at and I think it ties back to your uh, capital projects and everything else that we have. So I think it's, I think this last year has been fantastic, the leadership we've had in the TDC and the team that he has now and everything. And now we need to say, where are we going forward and how are we addressing this downturn? It shows all the beaches across. It shows that we got 100 uh, supplies versus Naples has 13 recovering from a, a hurricane, and Naples, I mean, Fort Myers, 51. So we're the big guy on a small area, and we need to say, what are we doing uh, on it? So that's the challenge that I think, bringing it all back together on this. So, Brian, 
I'm throwing it to you. I, and, and I'll try to wrap that all into some um, concise comments, but uh, we agree with you. And I think one of the things that we're going to focus on is um, we, we're starting that marketing um, committee um, with marketing experts from around the destination in different segments. And specifically on the accommodation side, uh, we don't just have one representative from the hotels. We have multiple representatives from multiple hotel segments. So we've got full service property, we've got uh, boutique, we've got uh, a representative for, from the short term rental uh, side of things. I believe it's a total of four or five representatives there. And the whole point of that is to look at how, what are they doing to market um, their types of properties and how do we align with that. Um, secondly, um, we actually have um, our agencies are in the room or on their way right now. Um, we're kicking off today um, the start of that planning with the marketing strategies um, that we're going to be using uh, moving forward. And we want to get started on this early. Um, and I credit uh, Steve uh, and his team in making sure that we, we do have a lot of new leadership. And using this data that we're seeing now, we want to make sure that we're doing something with it. So I think I answered, generally speaking, uh, what you were getting at. Thank you, sir. And, and, and I still like to make sure we address what are we doing and where are we going the next half of the year yep. is the piece. Yeah, yeah. So last month I reported on um, some forecast data. We received that on a quarterly basis from STR. So I don't have the most recent update uh, on that this month. However, that data did uh, allude to a, a drop in April and then things uh, coming closer and um, even going back and forth on, on rate um, for kind of this, this summer. Um, when we were looking at some of the information from key data as well, we, we also sort of saw a, a strong um, ho hopeful return uh, after April. Um, there was a State of the American Traveler uh, uh, webinar this past month. They do it every month, and, and there were some positive numbers that we can uh, hopefully report and share on in terms of uh, people's travel budgets uh, increasing a, a little bit more about their enthusiasm for travel growing. So there's, there's some positive information. I don't have um, an updated look, though, just because we haven't received that quarterly forecast data yet. Um, I do have some other forecast data, though, uh, um, let me time. just make sure oh, we got all the comments finished. Mike, did you have any additional comments? Madam Chair, yes. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I'll be brief. Um, first of all, Doreen, I, I don't mean to diminish um, the collaboration and the great work that uh, you and, and your organization has done um, to manage the vacation rental and the relationship with the TDC. Um, it's been extraordinary. Um, secondly, uh, perhaps I should not have used the word cannibalized um, in relation to the impact on the hotels. It is a it has had a, a negative impact on hotel occupancy. Uh, cannibalization was a wrong term. Um, and and I do appreciate that the uh, the vacation markets, the VRBOs, the Airbnbs are here to stay. But as Russ pointed out, let's make sure we, we continue to look at how we can best manage that relationship so that it is accretive to our overall marketing goals for the county. Last comment on Easter. You know, it's, it's just not Easter that was early this year. Um, Formula One was earlier. Um, Valspar was earlier. All of those contributed to a, a shortened season, if you will. When Easter is late in April, We've got a longer season when it's early and a lot of those other events fall in line. Uh, this year was kind of a perfect storm of early events created a, a, a shorter season for us. So um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Sure. And, um, you know, as we have airports that have had record breaking attendance and as Tampa alluded that their growth expectation is significant. Pi has had significant growth as well. And if we didn't have the diverse options for, um, you know, whether it's hotel or VRBO, then those hotels, you know, that would limit their capacity if there wasn't a, a, a diverse variety of accommodations in which people could stay. 
Um, but we definitely do have to come up with a way to manage uh, the growth of the Airbnb and VRBO and the vacation rentals um, in a way that is conducive for neighborhoods and also to meet the needs of the community. So thanks. And yeah, you can continue now. <laughs> All right, just two more slides, so hopefully I'll be quick here. But we did get some uh, forecast data from Global City Travel, which comes to us from Tourism Economics. Um, and this data was, was a, a good note. Uh, we expect about 72,000 additional international guests uh, this year. Uh, Canada definitely makes up that, the biggest part of our international market. Um, and we anticipate about 300,000 travelers from Canada in 2024. Um, that's an increase of about 10.5% from where we were last year. And you can see um, on the chart below our, our other markets too, where we anticipate and expect some growth, uh, particularly the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, Netherlands, uh, some of those Western European countries. And then um, in a Hopefully an hour or two, we'll, we'll receive the monthly uh, STR data, but we have been looking at uh, the weekly STR data from the month of March, and we do expect um, occupancy to be probably very close to where it was last year, uh, hopefully a little bit ahead, and, and revenue per available room and, and the, the rate to be uh, beyond what it was last year. So a little bit of positive news to, to hopefully end on. Um, and that's, that's all I have. Great, thank you. Any other additional comments, Doreen? Just wanted to wrap up um, some, and circle back on uh, Copley, your, your comments and Commissioner Scott also. Uh, from, uh, from everyone, concern about regulating the industry um, because these properties are in many cases unregulated, um, but the people who do register are paying the tax. And so, you yeah. know, Commissioner, to your comment uh, about the diverse types of rentals that we have. I, I personally, being involved in it, find it very difficult to have the state come in and tell areas like Pinellas County how to operate with this, this product um, when you've got other areas of the state that have no comprehension or any need for regulation. So there has to be an effort, and I appreciate hearing that you're, you're discussing this tomorrow. Um, there has to be some way that we can all work together because we have beach communities that, um, you know, looking at Indian Rocks Beach that has been hugely affected to, uh, Mayor, your comments about housing and how this is invading neighborhoods, so to speak. Maybe that was the wrong word to use, invading, but, you know, that it's compromising all different aspects, and I think with some proper regulation, uh, you can't just on a state level come back and say, this is how you're gonna do it, and then expect all communities of all sizes in Pinellas County to be able to regulate themselves. There's, it's an impossible task um, in terms of, of you know, staffing and, and, and uh, infrastructure to be able to do that. So thank you, I appreciate that. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Anything else for Eddie? Okay, thank you, appreciate it. And we're gonna move on to Kayla Peterson with the uh, WWE Royal Rumble Economic Review. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I'm here to talk about the economic impact that Royal Rumble brought to our community. Um, so to kind of start it off, uh, this was a competitive bid process where we partnered with uh, the Tampa Bay Rays, the City of St. Petersburg, and the Tampa Sports Commission to put together a joint bid uh, to go after this event. Um, we were a finalist uh, along with uh, the City of Orlando and Seattle. Ultimately, um, we were awarded the event, um, which included Royal Rumble on Saturday night, a Tales from the Crypt um, event in, in downtown Clearwater on Sunday, and then uh, we hosted... Um, Monday Night Raw over in, in Tampa on that uh, on that Monday night. So, in total, it was it was a great weekend uh, for our destination. And, and our part of that um, bid was was five hundred thousand dollars is what we committed. So what that brought, um, we set a record at Tropicana Field. Forty eight thousand uh, people attended the event. Um, tickets were sold in all fifty states and forty different countries. 
Uh, the direct spend from that event was just over $28 million. Uh, the total economic impact was just over 47, and it generated um, you know, just under $3, uh, $3 million in, in taxes. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about these numbers at times, but, but what does this mean? So we went out and, and we actually talked to some of our community businesses and just asked them, you know, what did this event mean for you and, and what did it contribute um, to you guys? Um, so some of the things that we heard back, uh, Sunrunner, 95% uh, increase in ridership on the, on the day of the event. Uh, Imagine Museum saw a 25% increase in attendance on that day or on, I'm sorry, on the Sunday following the event. Um, Ferg Sports Bar uh, did seven times the normal uh, amount of business on that Saturday, and, and Green Bench was up 10 to 15 percent. Uh, I don't know if some of you guys were down there, but downtown St. Pete was just electric. And, and uh, you know, what we heard from a lot of different people is that on a weekend that is typically pretty quiet on our side of the bay because of Gasparilla going on over in Tampa, it was, it was a home run for them. Uh, some of the hotel data, um, overall we had uh, just under 18,000 room nights um, on that Saturday. We saw a year-over-year -year increase of 26% uh, in RevPAR, just under 15% in ADR, and under, uh, just under 10% in, in occupancy. Um, kind of the, the final piece of it, and, and one that you know, I, I really in, enjoy, and, and I wish we could do this with more of our events, but the legacy that, um, that the WE is going to leave behind. Um, you know, on that Friday and Saturday morning leading into the event, they visited um, four different charities uh, and they, they uh, interacted with the, the kids, the youth of our communities, and they donated $15,000 to, to each of these, um, these charities. So uh, not only did they bring the impact during the event, but they're going to leave a lasting impact with our youth, and then that $15,000 will go to support those organizations as they, as they look to move forward. Um, and so, and kind of in, in recap, um, you know, I talked to WWE after the fact. I talked to the Rays after the fact. Um, you know, what they told me is, is they would do it again. And, and I think for us, I mean, that's, that's music to my ears because as we look to expand on the, uh, the types of events that we do, especially on this stage, uh, we want to we want to make sure that it's a success for everybody, uh, all parties included, um, as we look to, to kind of grow on this and, and do more. So, with that, any any questions that you guys have? Any questions? Comments? Uh, Copley? Thank you, Madam Chair. Caleb, thanks. Um, I was downtown the morning of uh, the Royal Rumble at the pier, and um, my kids were trying to figure out what these big belts were uh, that people were carrying around and walking around taking pictures with. And it was that whole day, you said it exactly right, it was electric that whole day. You could tell downtown was on fire. Um, just, I mean, just at the pier, it was incredible. Uh, they even, uh, right as we were leaving, they were coming to shoot a video on the pier, um, and there, there, some wrestlers came over, and it, it was really, really cool. And, and then speaking to some of the representatives from the Rays afterwards and their conversations with WWE, they're really excited to try to get this back here, and I know we are too. And this was a, this was a great showcase, and I know we watched some videos, I think, a couple of months ago. It was just an unbelievable showcase of not only St. Pete, but the area and, and what this area can do and host. And just a big thank you from me. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any well, other comments? Brian? I'm Chair, I would just make the comment, um, you know, kudos to Caleb, his team, everyone involved in, in making this a reality. Um, but we want to showcase this because um, as we make changes to um, whether it's elite event funding and, and we want to go after these large scale events and we don't want to be coming to you once a year showing you that, celebrating that we got the Royal Rumble to come here for one night. We want to, in the future, get to a point where we've got events like this coming on a monthly basis. Those are the events that we want to go after. They put heads in beds, they create economic impact, and we get um, a tremendous exposure for the destination. So they're win-win wins, uh, and we hope to bring more of these to you in the future. And uh, I thought it was a great event. What I would love to do is to figure out how to do the, the, the congestion and traffic a little better, because... I think I was in my car for close to three hours to get there. So, um, and it's a 20 minute drive for me to get to Tropicana. So, and I think it was three hours from my house to the parking place. So, um, so hopefully we can, we can uh, take the experience from that and found, find better ways to streamline how traffic moved. Um, even though Sunrunner was busy, Sunrunner couldn't move. 
because um, that bus stayed right along with me most of the way. So, um, so it would be really great to find a way that we could streamline that a little bit better. But otherwise, I thought it was an outstanding event. And the more we have, the better we get. So I know and if we have it again, that that problem will probably be, you know, instead of three hours, it might be an hour and a half. Because we always learn, if, we, if we're smart, yeah. we analyze it, we learn from it, and we, we always do better. So the more of these events that we bring in, the better we'll be at that. And so, um, so yeah, I look forward to it, and I hope we have a whole lot more. Every month would be outstanding. Yeah. So thanks so much. Yeah, and that's, and that's some of the conversation I heard from St. Petersburg after the fact is, you know, some lessons you learn the hard way. Yeah. And it was a great learning experience as a community, what we need to do to, to host these significant events. And as, as we look into the future and wanting to do this more, um, I think it'll serve us well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Any other comments? Thank you. So we're going to move on to um, Brian, who's going to talk about our strategic plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I wanted to um, bring something that is very familiar, um, yet unknown to many of you, um, our strategic plan. And a couple years ago, um, we went on a strategic planning process. Um, and there was tremendous outreach, public engagement, stakeholder engagement, staff engagement. Um, but we never really brought it in for a landing. Um, so that's what we're doing today. Um, and you will see. Some, some things you've seen in the past in this first one, these four focus areas, um, this is what we're here, th this is what we're gonna be focusing on. And if, if our efforts, if we're doing something that doesn't relate to one of these four things, we're not doing it anymore. Um, so we want to increase the economic impact of each visitor. You hear us speak about this a lot. Um, visitors that stay for multiple nights, utilize multiple attractions throughout the region and generally uh, impact the economic impact um, more. We want to develop the assets of the, re of the region. We know that um, travelers, their tastes and expectations constantly change. And so adding new capital investments that promote tourism um, throughout the community is going to be a focus. Increasing the economic benefits of tourism to the local community, um, really ensuring that locals can earn gainful employment and that Pinellas County residents uh, receive and are aware of the economic benefits uh, of tourism, and then deepening our partnerships across Pinellas County, working towards including more Pinellas County in the tourism landscape. So cities, chambers, attractions, those who you might not typically consider as part of the tourism ecosystem, we want to engage uh, with them. Mission and vision statement. Um, this is, so some of the things on the mission statement when uh, this process um, was, was in progress, um, we did have uh, some input from, from stakeholders on, on a mission. Um, it wasn't clear to me what that was. Uh, so we went through and took, took off where we left off last time uh, and put together this mission and vision statement. So, um, our mission of Visit St. Pete Clearwater, we want to drive the economic engine of tourism by attracting local, national, and international visitors with our expertise, innovation, and, and creativity. And for our vision, our vision is to inspire travel to Pinellas County, a destination of unique communities, distinct cultures, and vibrant experiences. So you've got our four focus areas. You've got our mission and vision. Um, we want to really um, implement this through establishing KPIs. Uh, and so what we have, where we landed was, uh, we have a set of organization-wide KPIs, and these are gonna be those um, high-level numbers that you all are used to, to seeing. In addition to establishing these KPIs uh, for the organization and for each of the three divisions, uh, we establish goals, uh, and we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to those goals. Um, we are gonna report out on a quarterly basis, our progress on these. Some of them will be monthly updated, some of them will be quarterly, some will be annually, uh, but on a quarterly basis, we'll report out to you all so, so you can see our progress uh, of what we're doing and how we're moving the needle. So some of these organization-wide, annual economic impact, uh, occupied hotel room nights, ADR, travel party daily spend, bed tax collection, total visitors to Pinellas County. 
Um, so you will, generally speaking, see goals established throughout these KPIs from between 3 and 10% growth in 2024. When we move over to the business development KPIs, this encompasses uh, the KPIs for all of the business development departments. Um, so we're going to be looking at hotel room nights uh, from sales and marketing and meetings. This was something that uh, Mr. Kimball alluded to earlier. Hotel room nights from sales, marketing, and sports, um, same thing. Uh, increased attendance for repeat business, travel, trade, tour operators, engagement. How many folks um, Rose and her team and Andre and her team are uh, educating on the destination and new markets uh, internationally and domestically? Partners uh, that uh, participate in our sales opportunities. Um, repeat business, tracking in SimpleView. This is something that we recently had uh, the SimpleView folks in town to make sure that we're um, utilizing our CRM system on a consistent basis across the uh, entire organization. Community engagement KPIs, this is going to be a big focus for, for us. So um, we are getting ready to do our partner survey. Uh, we want to make sure that we actually engage our partners uh, with their um, uh, um, participation rate. Total active community ambassadors, these are the folks that our brand activations team is working with, and they are, uh, as they like to say, the mouthpiece of the destination at these events, at these elite events, at community events when they're out there. Uh, they're telling our story and inspiring repeat visitation, in-county activations, uh, maintain a 89% um, satisfaction rate in our resident per perception study, a uh, number of community meetings that our folks are attending. That's chamber events, rotary clubs, city uh, council meetings. They want to be out and about in the community. And then marketing KPIs. Uh, this one's a couple pages, a little longer. Obviously, it's a, it's a large part of what we do. Um, and so we want to be tracking the ROI of our ad effectiveness study, stories carried by out-of-market media, total social media um, reach, how many emails are clicked. These are the sort of things that we know uh, moves the needle, and we're going to be focusing on these and tracking our progress. Um, I will just wrap up on this by saying, um, you know, we'll report out on a quarterly basis and annually we're going to review this. This is our first time having this, so we wanted a starting point. Uh, we want to set goals that are um, uh, uh, they're attainable, they're challenging, but they're attainable. And then every year we're going to evaluate, hey, do we need to adjust those goals? Uh, are there any performance indicators that we're missing and we should be including or any that we need to get rid of um, because they don't equate to our focus areas? So I want to thank uh, you all for those of you that participated uh, in this process uh, on your time on the board. And I also want to uh, thank our staff who uh, for a long time had been engaged in that process. And bringing this thing in for a landing is really going to give us a good tool moving forward. So uh, happy to take any questions you have on this. Any questions or comments? Sure, Madam Chair. Okay, Mike. Brian, bravo, bravo, bravo. We've been talking about this for years, and through your leadership, you got it done. Uh, congratulations. Long, long overdue and very welcome to have. Hats off to you. Thanks to the team, sir. Any other comments or questions? Clyde. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the one area that I just want to see where it falls in here is the um, from visitors with love the community campaign of to tote the you know what the tourism brings to us as we find some communities that aren't as engaged with our visitors. Where does that fit in? So you that said would, it's not there. That yeah. would be you'll hear more about that next month specifically um, when we go through department budgets. Um, but I'll tell you that would fall under. My assumption would it be it would it would play into the um, residents' perception study. I believe that would be a portion uh, of that study. Um, so uh, maybe you're thinking of a recall of the campaign from from locals. Um, everything that we have on here, I think the we just have to make sure that we have a, a accurate way to measure that. And so everything that's in here, we have a precise. Um, way that we can can accurately measure that. I think we would measure that in the resident perception survey as a specific question. OK. 
Okay. Just want to make sure that keeps going. I think it's very helpful for all. Sorry of us. for the long answer. That's all right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay. Brian, I think you're up next. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a few things. Um, so one of the, the best things I get to do is introduce new team members to you all. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on uh, in the organization, and it's our team that makes it happen. So uh, happy to introduce first um, Stephanie Priakos, who has started uh, just in the last couple uh, weeks, and she is in our groups team, and she's a group sales manager uh, working on the Midwest market. So uh, please join me in welcoming her, and she can uh, introduce herself and say a little bit about. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say I am very, very proud to be part of an exceptionally talented team at VSPC, and thank you, Brian, for bringing me on board. Um, as he mentioned, I am the sales manager <clears throat> for meetings and conferences, and my market is the Midwest, so I look forward to working very closely with the hotel partners and bringing as many meetings to the hotels as I possibly can. Um, a little bit about myself, I have been in the tourism industry almost all of my adult life. It is a passion of mine, and I've been fortunate to have visited almost 80 countries in the world, and I've lived in six. But for the last 17 years, Pinellas County is my home, and I absolutely love it, which says everything. The destination is my passion, and I'm looking forward to selling it once more. Um, I did it for 12 years at Sarada Beach Resort and brought people down to our destination. And if uh, my name rings a bell with anybody, my brother-in-law, Bill Priakas, served on the TDC for almost three years. So very happy to be here and look forward to working with everybody. Thank you. Welcome. Wonderful, welcome. And next up uh, is Eddie Delgado, and he is um, our new communications uh, manager. Eddie, if you'd like to come up and introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, as um, Brian just mentioned, my name is Eddie Delgado. I'm the new communications manager. I'm super happy to have joined uh, Visa St. Pete Clearwater. Um, just like Stephanie mentioned, uh, destination is something that is also uh, something that is a passion of mine, so I'm very excited to be working with, with you and the, the rest of the team. A little bit about me, I've been fortunate to work not only domestically in the U.S., but also internationally, uh, always touching a little bit on the tourism side, so a little bit of it in destination marketing, um, most of them within Florida destinations, and part of it also with attractions, which was my um, last experience having worked uh, with the biggest attraction in Hillsborough County, managing external, internal, and crisis communications for them. So I'm very happy uh, with the opportunity, So, um, and looking forward to working with you and working under the leadership of Brian, Steve, and, and Jason. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. Next, um, just a reminder that um, uh, update to you all, the uh, last month you all recommended and this past week the Board of County Commissioners approved new guidelines for elite event funding. That application cycle is now open. Um, tomorrow, uh, Craig and his team will be holding a community meeting, informational meeting on that, and that application cycle will, will be open until May 7th. Um, third, I wanted to make an announcement to you all, and you will be receiving an email in your, or excuse me, an invite in your email um, later today. Um, but the besties are back, and um, I want, I'm proud to announce that we're bringing back the besties. It's going to be at Innisbrook uh, on May 16th. And for those of you that have never heard of the besties, don't know what the besties are. Um, the besties are uh, the way that we get to recognize our industry. Our, our industry partners for making this destination what it is. Um, so we've got 35 different categories we will be recognizing uh, with a presentation of besties. Um, everything from, I believe, best, suns, best beach to best restaurant to best 
hotel. Um, it runs the gamut, and it's something that really brings our industry together. So uh, I know the team's excited to, to pull it off. I'm excited to be a part of that, and I know that our stakeholders are going to be excited to, that that's back. Fourth, um, just a reminder, um, May 2nd, over at the Sheridan Sand Key, we will have our joint meeting with the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, we're we just finalized that agenda, uh, so you will be receiving that this week. Uh, and between now and that meeting, I will uh, reach out to you individually um, to answer any questions that you have. And then uh, May 15th, our next Tourist Development uh, Council meeting will be here. And there we're going to focus on our budget presentation for the department. So uh, it'll be similar to last year's, but improved on last year's. We're going to go over SWOT analysis for the different divisions and departments, as well as their individual budgets, what their priorities are, and what, what they're going to be focusing on. And then last but not least, um, June 19th meeting. Uh, that's going to be canceled. So um, take advantage of uh, an open month. And uh, that's what I've got for you, Madam Chair. Great. Anyone have any comments or questions for Brian? Doreen? Yes, question. Um, Brian and I touched on this. I was thinking that the May 2nd meeting was going to replace May 15th meeting, the regular meeting, but it's not. So uh, the Zoom conferencing, I will not be in town. And Zoom conferencing, is this something we're going to continue? Uh, using um, on a basis of voting whether we want to or not, or is the budget meeting possibly not an appropriate Zoom meeting? So, Your thoughts? Brian, you may have a comment on that. Now, I don't know if we have the capacity at the Sheridan on May 2nd to do Not Zoom. the May 2nd, the May 15th. The May Thank 15th. You. We do have the ability to do Zoom here, um, and so that's an easy thing to do. I don't think we could put the budget off because of the timing for the BCC to vote on it. So not uh, putting it off, but I mean, could could it be could I participate via Zoom? Yes. And is that an appropriate subject that would work via Zoom on the fifteenth? This was really my question. I feel very confident. Yes. Um, Thank you. And you'll just be patient with me on watching you raise your hand. Um, Thank you. So um, yeah, yeah, that's fine, and we'll vote it in just like we did for Mike today, and that would be appropriate. So thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your vacation time to to work with us. Any other questions or comments for Brian? Okay. Um, so I would look for board member comments and discussion. Anything that's hard burning you want to talk about? So I, I do have something, if nobody else, before you're all ready to leave, I know. Um, I sent the article about the Michelin stars to Brian. I didn't realize that was something you had to buy into. Um, but I think we have a lot of restaurants in, this Pinell, in Pinellas County that could rank in the Michelin stars. And, uh, you know, I travel to destinations based on restaurants sometimes. And I know there's a whole lot of people that are foodies that will travel to destinations based on those stars. And so I know I talked to Brian about it. He said that, you know, staff is discussing it. But, um, you know, I don't know how you all felt about it or if you wanted to have a conversation about it. But I think it's something that's important that we should be actively engaged in. And I had no idea that you had to buy into it. So that was a surprise to me. If you haven't seen the article, it was in the Tampa Bay Times, I believe, yesterday. Did I send that to you? Um, and actually, we could send that out to you to, to read. Um, if Tracy could send that out. Sure thing. Great. So uh, it, it's worth reading. Um, Tampa's been, Hillsborough County's been very successful at getting some restaurants rated. <clears throat> and I, I think Pinellas County should be doing the same thing. So there's just my thought. I don't know if anybody has, Doreen, do you have comments on that? Not on that, though. No. Anybody else? Copley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, unfortunately, it's pay to play. Um, I had a friend own a Michelin-starred restaurant, and um, it's, it's an odd system, but uh, I totally agree that we have some amazing restaurants here in Pinellas County. I also travel because of food. <laughs> And um, we certainly have some that just by experience alone, having been at other Michelin restaurants, if it were not a pay to play, I think would absolutely be on there. Um, and so uh, whatever we can do to support, uh, I wish the system was different, but whatever we can do to support, I'd certainly be in favor of. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on that? No? Okay. Well, we'll have staff continue to look into it and see uh, if it's something we're going to move forward on. but. That's something I think would be favorable. 
So, um, so if there's no other discussion or comments, then I, I would board. look for a move to adjourn. Oh, wait, wait, we're not Sorry. there yet. Doreen. I just wanted to go back to Eddie's presentation about the destination metrics okay. uh, and wanted to point out a couple things. Um, under the most liked aspect, it's really interesting to me that attractions, museums, aquariums, et cetera, are on the top of the list and how the, we have so much to offer in Pinellas County. So all those other categories, but it, it is as we have seen, People come here for the beaches, but they also want to do all these other things. And so with attractions and museums being right there on the top, it's just forefront, as you know, I'm the, your representative on the TDC to create a Pinellas, our local arts agency, and how much um, we appreciate representing Pinellas County in the arts and culture aspect that working together with VSPC. We've, we see that rising to the top, and these statistics are showing that, uh, and how that joint effort has just really brought us to the forefront. Um, and those of you, all of us that have been here for, in my case, I was born here. So when we look and see the number of museums and uh, arts, areas that, that have grown, um, it just, we are so unique in that aspect, and, and I appreciate VSPC and Creative Pinellas marketing that for Pinellas County. Thank you. I agree. Any other comments? All right, I look for a motion to adjourn. Okay, Mo meeting adjourned. Thank you, have a great rest of the month, and I look forward to seeing you.